good afternoon. At least it's the afternoon in the city and state that I live in, that I'm currently living in. My name is uh, Eddie Johnson, EJ the Automotive Detail Innovator. I, uh, for those that didn't know, I was born uh, in the city of Mobile, the state of Alabama. I lived in the city of Mobile, the state of Alabama, some would say Mobile County, for the first 22 years of my life. After that, in January of 1983, I moved to the Atlanta, Georgia area, and from the Atlanta, Georgia area, in 1994, September 1994, I moved out to the Seattle area. Now, before I came out to the Seattle area, I had two brothers living out in the Seattle area. They was both a little younger than what I was, and they had nothing but good things to say about uh, the Seattle area as far as how people treated you. They uh, grew up in Alabama like I did through the 60s, and um, it's no doubt about the South and made history for the slave trade, right? So the South is still heavily pre prejudiced. Now prejudice of racism has grown a lot further than just the color of your skin. Now it could be considered your religious beliefs, your sexual preferences, who you associated with. It's so many things that cover racism today is not as simple as it was back when my brothers and I was growing up in the 60s, right? So they told me that if I came out to Seattle, it would be a, like a breath of fresh air for me. And they was telling me how most of the people in the Seattle area treat you as a human being, a human being without factoring in your color. So I liked that idea. So I wasn't sure how long I was gonna live out in the Washington State area or the Seattle, Washington area. So I wanted to play it safe because I like living in Atlanta. So what I did is I put all my personal in storage and uh, I even had my car in storage, and I came out here on the Greyhound bus. Now, unlike some that travel on the bus or the airplane or however they might travel to get to another state, I decided to take very, the things that I brought was minimal. I could have brought a lot more clothes. I could have brought a lot more shoes. I could have brought a whole lot more than what I brought. But like I said, I didn't know how long I was gonna be out here. But what I did bring, and I had to check with, cause I came out here on the Greyhound bus. So I had checked with Greyhound bus, how much it was gonna cost me to put some boxes, extra boxes, not luggage, but boxes up under there uh, underneath the bus where the luggage is carried. So once I found out how much they charge per box, I got me four nice size boxes and inside that boxes I had two buffers, one an orbable buffer, a little round orbable buffer. I have one here and I'll show y'all some of the items I have for when I get ready to go more mobile, um, and I show y'all the type of buffer that I'm talking about, but I had a round audible. I had my Makita. At the time, my Makita that I had was uh, high and low gear. This was before I owned my first variable speed Makita buffer. I'm not even sure if they even had variable speed uh, Makita buffer in the early 90s, and if so, I didn't have one, all right? So I had the two buffers, I had a vacuum cleaner, 
I had a lot of microfibers and regular tiles, like one of the tiles. I had some compound, I had some waxes, I had some cutting pads, and I had some finishing pads. So basically everything I brought was detail related, and I had the intentions on using them chemicals, that equipment, to put money in my pocket if my money started running low. Um, I had no idea how it was going to be when I got here for us, the automotive trade, detailing trade. Now, my brother and them told me that it rained out here a whole lot, and they told me that they didn't think that I would make any money in the automotive detailing trade out here, and they actually suggested that I got me a good warehouse job or maybe got a job working with the city or something like that, or maybe even uh, Metro, which is being a Metro bus driver, a transportation, a public transportation bus driver. It got all these different ideas on what I could do when I came to Seattle. None of the things that they suggested to me that they thought might be right for me had anything to do with the automotive detailing trade. So when I got out here and my brother came to pick me up, I'm putting these boxes on his back seat and a couple of them on his tr um, in his trunk. And he asked me, man, what in these boxes? And I told him mostly detail or uh, related uh, items and chemicals. And he said, man, you could have left that at home. You could have left that where you was living at. You're not going to need that out here. So I say, hey, it's what I brought. So after being out here for a couple of weeks, my money started getting low. And it was a, a, a self-serve car wash, like, across from the apartment complex I was living at with my brothers. I grabbed my buffer one day, and I grabbed some, some, uh, some compound some wax, and some um, glazing polish. And I went up to the um, to the car wash. I looked around. I saw electrical outlet. So I just started hanging around at the car wash. Um, and then when I saw someone pull up and it was about to run the car through the car wash, I asked them, could I, uh, I, I would tell them my detailed cars and could I look at the car. And I would walk around their cars and look for, Things that like scratches or scuff marks that I know I could buff out, and I would offer them my services. Some people said no. Some people asked me how much, and when I told them, they played with the price a little bit, but they allowed me to do it. So I made me some um some um money. wasn't a lot of money, but it was some money. The first job I got in in um the Seattle area that had me working in downtown Seattle was a salon. And then the second job I got in downtown Seattle was another salon. Now I had to work a couple of salons when I was living in Georgia. To be honest, I didn't really like working for salons. I like working for automotive dealerships. You seem to get treated better. You had better benefits and you got paid a certain amount of money regardless. Working at a lot of these salons, they had different ways you could make a certain amount of money. I really didn't like that. And then salons was like come and gone, right? If the weather was good and they needed your help, you could work. But as the weather got bad and the work, customer pay work slowed down, then you either got laid off or you didn't make any money. So I knew I wasn't going to get caught up working for no salon like that. And then at the time, my brothers were living in Kent, in uh, Kent, Washington, which was outside. It was one of the cities outside downtown Seattle. So the amount of money it cost me to catch the city line bus to downtown Seattle, the amount of Money cost me cost me to go home, let alone if I didn't pack a lunch, 
was more money in some cases that I made that day. So I was like, wow, man, this place is very expensive. You know, uh, you made, you made more money, if you look at it, than you did. You made more money living in Atlanta and doing automotive detailing work in Atlanta than you make it right now. And the cost of living is higher here. So you got to make some things work out. Uh, it's not going to benefit you to live this far away uh, from family. And when I say family, I had, like I said, I had brothers out here. But when I left Atlanta, I had two children in Atlanta. You know, my ex-wife had remarried, but I still had two children that I was spending uh, a certain amount of time with uh, every month. So I was like, okay, you're going out here to try to better your life. In return, you could do more for your children. And if you're not in a predicament to better your life because you're not making the amount of money you need to better your life, then you're kind of spinning your wheels. So I told myself I would give myself a year. I said, I would try to give myself a year to where if it didn't work back, work out in the Seattle areas, I could go back. Now, I had, I was cleaning buildings up at night while I was living in Atlanta and the guy I was working for, he told me if I decided to come back, I could always work for him. And if I needed the place, He'll help me get my feet up under me by helping me get an apartment, even if he had to front me the money because he actually wanted me to work for him again. So I left having some doors open if I had to return. Okay, this was in September of 1994. I got my first dealership job on Halloween. It was October the 31st, 1994. The dealership that I applied for, I had worked for the same brand of cars that that dealership that I had applied for, right? So when I was living in Atlanta, I worked for the dealership, and I was at that dealership almost three years, and it was a good job. So when I put in the application at a dealership that sells the same type of cars, well, to be honest, it was a Saturn dealership. I had worked for a Saturn dealership for about, close to three years in Atlanta. So when I came out here in October, uh, it was before Halloween, like a couple of days before Halloween, I put in the application and I told the service manager that interviewed me, I had experience uh, working on Saturn cars because I was a Saturn dealership when I was living in Atlanta that I had worked for for almost three years. He asked me the name of the dealership. I didn't have no idea he was going to pick up the phone and call them. He picked up and called the dealership while I was sitting in his office. And as he talking to the service manager about having me, uh, that I came and applied for a job with them and what he thought about me my, as a, person and, and, and as a worker, as an experience, enough detailer, um, he put the service manager on loudspeaker, right? And I could hear the service manager tell him that I was a good employee, a good detailer, and he hated to see me leave. But I told him I wanted to go, or uh, I wanted to relocate to another state. And he also told this new service manager that I'm trying to get a job at, that if I ever came back to the Georgia area and I was looking for a job, he would hire me with that, with, you know, you know, you know, no problem. I can get a job with them again. So I got hired there. Okay, I started on Halloween. And now I'm back into what I'm really used to. No, no auto salons or actual dealership. So I'm working at this dealership, and the amount of money I'm making at the dealership was hourly. When I left uh, Atlanta, my last two jobs at automotive dealership was flat rate. I still haven't gotten into the groove of flat rate. 
right? I was trying to figure out a way to make flat rate work for me. So I was kind of fortunate that the dealership that I got, the first dealership job I got, and uh, it was actually in Renton, Washington. Renton, Washington was another city outside the city of Seattle. Was in flat rate. So I worked for that. I worked for Saturn from October 94 until I would say April. And in the process of working, for Saturn, I was looking around for another detailing job at another dealership that would possibly pay me more money because the amount of money I was making at Saturn, the people at Saturn was nice, just like the people at Saturn that I worked for in Georgia. They were good people. I got along with the workers, but the money didn't equal to the amount of money I was making in uh, the Atlanta area, mainly because Washington State and Seattle surrounding cities, cost of living was higher. So since the cost of living was higher, I needed to make more money. So I ended up getting a part-time job working at a trim shop down the street from, uh, from the Saturn dealership. Trim shop was in Renton, Washington, too. Okay, the trim shop had me when their uh, installers put in a sunroof, put in an alarm system, do tent, or any kind of running boards or ground effects. My job was to clean up behind the installers. So whatever they messed up, whatever they got dirty, if they got scratches in something during the process of trying to install something, my job was to fix that, right? That way when the customer got the car back, the car would be in the same condition that the customer, that it was when the customer dropped it out. Now they had their own paint booth. So if it was a scratch too deep that I couldn't fix, they would have the painter paint it, right? So I ended up working at the trim shop full time. And now I'm doing Saturn just two days a week, Saturday and Sunday. Okay, by the time May came, I'm like, man, I'm working two days. I'm working two different jobs. I'm working seven days a week. There's still not enough money. I need more money. So when I got out from the trim job, I started walking around because at this time I didn't have a car. So I started walking around the area of renting and I went straight to the used car lots. I didn't go to no new car lots because I was working at a new car lot when I was working at Saturn. So I said I would try the uh, used car lots. Not knowing if I'm going to get in the business, but I'm just trying to find out with with if any of these used car lots could use someone with my expertise in the automotive detailing. The first used car lot that I walked up on and I talked to the GM, he told me, yes, I could use myself a good detailer. And he told me that he, the guy that he had detailing his cars was business was down the street he said the guy turned around with too slow for us taking the car and getting the car back to him. He said the guy was doing other business, which he didn't mind, but it's like the guy had him on the back burner. He was like the last person to get his cars back compared to the other uh, um, um, dealerships that were using the same detail shop. And he told me the work is not that good. The details that I'm getting in return is not that good. He said, it's not working out for me. He said, so I would be glad to try a new detailer. I explained to him that I was working two days, uh, I was working two different jobs, seven days a week. And I told him I didn't have a place to take. If he, Even if I decided to do business with him or even if he decided to let me do his cards, I had nowhere to take his cards. 
because I didn't have no place to detail them. Detail them at. He told me on a nice day, you could detail my cars on my own property. That way my cars ain't got to go nowhere. He said, I got water, I got electricity, and I got that little awning out there to where you could pull a car underneath the awning and do your buffing and do it in the interior. So that sounds just like something I wanted to do. So I told him to give me a little time and I'm going to get back with him. So I'm still working these two jobs. And my path crossed the guy path that I worked with when I was working in Seattle at one of the salons. I told him what was going on with me. And I told him I could really use a place to do work out of. And he told me about a detail shop down the street in Renton that he told me that the old, the guy that ran it was a reverend. And he said the guy, the guy detail shop himself could hold about 12 cars. And he told me the guy was known for renting space to detail them. And he said that you should go talk to the guy. Tell the guy that I told you about him and see what the guy say. So when I get out from the trim shop, I go, I walk around, talk to the guy. And he told me, yes, I could rent you a stall, right? And he told me, if you don't have your own work or the times that you don't have work, he said, you could do cars for me. He said, I pay you $30 a car for a full detail if you use your own chemical. If you use my chemicals, I paid $25 a car for every car you did. Now, when I was going downtown, uh, downtown Seattle to the salons, the most I got was $22 a car. Now, I already knew since this guy had a uh, detail shop and I, and I already had done talk to him and he, he knew I was going to be bringing my own work into the shop. So he had no problem with that. He told me, he would rent me space for $300 a month. And he told me I could stay in the detail shop as long as I wanted to stay in there for it's working. He said, just make sure you lock up when you leave. So now I got a place to not just take this first used car lot that I talked to that said I could do business with them, even if I had to do it on their property. Now I got a place to take his car now what I need to do is get me another used car lot. And like the guy that owned the detail shop told me that I could do cars for him. So the first thing I did is I worked a two-week notice at Saturn. I left Saturn and I started going from the trim shop. I got off at five. I would go by the uh, first used car lot that I got and I would pick up a car. I would let the guy know I would have a car back to him the next day, around the same time I picked the car up. I would go to the detail shop. I would stay there until I cleaned one car. It was times I left that dealer, that uh, detail shop at 11, 12. A couple of times I left at 1 in the morning. But I was still back at the trim shop later that morning by 8 o'clock. So now I'm doing two used car lots and I'm doing work for the guy that owned the detail shop. I don't need a trim shop no more because it's in my way. I can make more money if I get rid of the trim shop. I have more time to work, right? More time to go out and get more business and bring it in. So I worked the notice at the trim shop and I let the trim shop go. Okay, there was stipulations with the uh, detail shop that the Reverend owned that I had to have before I started working for him. First thing, I had to have my own detail license. Whatever my name, my business, I needed to go down and get a master uh, detailing license and I needed to get a tax exempt information 
because the uh, guy that owned the detail shop said, all the money I pay you, I'm paying you straight. I am going to sub my work out to you. By selling my work out to you, I don't have to pay taxes on having you work for me. And I don't have to take taxes out of the money that I give you. That's your responsibility because you're going to have a master business license in automotive detailing. You're going to have a tax ID number. At the end of the year, your tax ID number, all the money that you made off me, is going to be written to you with your tax ID number on it. That way, I ain't responsible for paying your taxes. You're responsible for paying, for paying your own taxes. And so that's how that works. Okay, I got those items, and that's when he let me move in and start working. It started off at $300 a month. Then after about six months, uh, the Reverend tells me, you know, I underestimate your earning potential. He said, I got two sons working in there with you. And with my two sons working in the detail department with you, you're outperforming both of my sons. And he said, when you add up the amount of money that I pay you a month, but doing my work, then you add up the amount of money that you make bringing in business into my detail shop. That's all yours. I'm not getting a percent of the money that you make. And I explained to him that our deal wasn't consistent on him getting the percentage of what I made. My de our, our deal was based on me paying him $300 a month. That was it, right? And if I wanted to, I could do work for him, and he would pay me. But it was never based on uh, percent of how much money I do. So then the Reverend tells me, we're going to negotiate a new deal. He said, every month, I want to see your paperwork. I want to see how much money you made that month. And out of the amount of money you made a month, I'm going to charge you a percent of of the money you made a month. And I told him that didn't sound right. It sounded like to me he was trying to rob me. And he told me, well, this is how it's going to be. And if you're not willing to work like that, then I give you a couple of weeks and you can move out, move out of here. Even, even at that time, I didn't know where I was going to go. I wasn't going to let him take advantage of me like that because that wasn't a deal. The initial deal was... I pay him $300 a month. I got the right to come and go as I please. I can stay as late as I want to at night, as long as I locked up, lock up when I leave. And all that both are being consistent, and consistent or tied in with the amount of money that I paid him, which was the 300 bucks. So I told him I wasn't willing to do that. And he said, okay, you have a couple of weeks to move. If you don't move in a couple of weeks, by the next week, if you still here, after the two weeks are over with, the next following week, at the end of that week, I want to see your paperwork, and then I figure out how much money I want to charge you, and it's going to be based on the percentage of the money you made. So I was still living with my brothers. I went home and I told my brother what was going on. They're like, oh, man, sound like the Reverend trying to rob you, man. That's bad. So one of my brothers told me that he had a friend that was doing electrical work. And he was doing electrical work at a, a, a storage facility called, uh, what's the name of it? SureGuard, SureGuard Storage Facility. He said he got SureGuard Storage Facility somewhere everywhere. Every city and community surrounding um, outside Seattle, outside Seattle, have cheer guards. He said you should look them up in the phone book. I said, man, I don't think no no um, storage unit gonna uh, work for me because I'm gonna need water and electricity. And my brother said, you'll never know if you don't ask him. So the next morning, I got up, I got the phone book out. 
I turn to storage storages, and I see all these different sugar storages. Now I wanted to make sure I stay within the area that I live living in, cause now I got a car, right? So I call the first three storage places I call. They told me they would allow me to run my business out of the storage unit. They told me it was things that we had to discuss and they wanted me to come in in person because they didn't want to discuss it in the phone on the phone. So I went to visit one of the places that was closer to Renton. Matter of fact, it was in Renton. That way I wanted to take the cars too far. So I get there and I talk to them and they tell me we could furnish you electricity and we could furnish you water to a degree. But they say, to be honest, this is not set up for you to do motors or not even prep a car, right? Because this is a storage facility. Said that periodically, we'll let you prep a car here. But you can't, it can't get to the point where every car you're doing, you're doing it on this property. You got to figure something else out. So I know doing my travels around renting, picking cars up, dropping cars off. I had to came across two store, not store units, but two um, self-serve car wash, right? So I said, okay, if I got everything I need to have in a five gallon bucket, if I got myself some wheel assay, I got myself some degreasers, I got myself some detail brush, I got everything I need to prep a car. I could prep a car. I could pick the car up from the dealership, used car dealership, take it straight to the uh, self-serve car wash, do all the prep work there, take the car back to the storage unit, and I could do the interior and I could do the exterior right there. And that's what I did. All right, I did that from, I would say... November of 1995, and it was hard being in the storage unit too, very difficult, because the storage unit didn't have no insulation, and the build, build the building itself was made of aluminum, so it was cold, right? It was very, very cold. It was almost like like working outside. I did that from October to 95, uh, for us being in the storage unit, till early 96. Now, during the process of being in the storage unit, I met a wholesaler that was buying cars for a place that I did details for, right? And he asked me where my business was located. I told him down the street from the dealership that you and I'm doing business at. And I told him that I was inside of a storage unit and he asked me how that how was how was it working for me? I told him I'm making it work for me. It's not the best setup, but it's mine's and I'm making it work for me. And he said, I'd like to check it out one day. I said, Okay, sure. Several several different times I see the guy dropping off a car, picking up a car, when I was going to drop off a car and pick up a car. And he would ask me how I'm doing. We would talk. One time he asked to take me back to the storage unit where my business was ran out of ran out of and I had told him I would walk and he said, Well, I got time and you don't have a car to, to drive back and I want to see you set up. So I said, okay, fine. I ride with him, we get to the storage unit, we get out, I unlock the door, she walk around and look, he said, Man, it's really nice. He said, like you said, you made this here actually work for you. He said, the reason why I want to see it, because I got a building in uh, Berrien, Washington. I got a building. And he said, been a detail shop on two occasions. And inside the building can hold 14 cars. He said, I got cars in there that I own, classic cars, and I got cars that I keep for other people that pay me to store the car. He said it has three bay doors, and if you come and move in with me, you can have the middle, 
and you can have the last door on the end to operate your business. Now, I got a big fence that stands over 10 feet tall, and inside that fence that I hold 100 cars. He said, for his money, he said, you could do four cars for me a month to pay the, for rent, or you could give me 400 bucks a month to rent. He said, I don't care how many cars you move out when you come to work. You can move every car I got in there out if you're willing to jumpstart them because some of them been sitting up for months. But the thing is, you got to put them all back at the end of the day. He said, you can have free freedom of the shop because I stay gone most of the time and I want the place open. I want the doors open. I want them bring this place back alive because it's dead. It was laughter here. It was good times here during the time the other uh, guys was running detail shops, running detail out of this place. And I want to bring it back. And he said, since I have customers come here to look at cars and possibly buy cars, I basically need a house sitter, somebody to hold the fort down when I'm out buying cars, looking for cars. So I told him, let me think about it. I got to thinking about it. One day I called him on the phone. We made a plan. I went out there. We sat in his office and talked. And we drank tea. As we got to drinking tea, he turned the lights on. And it was like a different world. I could tell by the way this place smelled that the doors ain't been open in a while, in a long time. It had that kind of like wet mildew smell. But man, it was about as large as he told me. As a matter of fact, it was larger inside than I could imagine. It was actually larger than the first detail place I rented space out of when I moved in with the Reverend. And uh, so he asked me what we what I thought, and I told him I thought that would work for me. Now, to back up a little bit, when I first went into business, the only thing that I had, like I told you, I came out with a vacuum cleaner. I came out here with a couple of puffers. I came out here with some some chemicals and stuff, but it's a lot of things I didn't have. have. The first used car lot that I got, that I started working with, uh, they asked me what did I need to allow me to do to perform a better service for them. In other words, what do you need for your detail business to where you could clean our carpets better, clean our upholstery better, and, and on and so forth. So I told them I needed a carpet cleaning machine. I told them it would be nice if I had a ozone machine for cars that have smells, right? And they asked me to put a list together of the things I need, try to give them prices, and when I get through, present it to them which I did that. They looked at it, and they said, okay, this is what we'll do. They'll say, we normally pay you every week. They say, we'll lend you the money to buy everything you got on the list. We're going to front you the money. In return, when you do our cars every week, you pay us back some of the money every week that we front you. We're not charging no interest or nothing. We just put you in a better predicament to help you help yourself and help you help us by doing a better job on our cars. And so that's how that went down. So by the time I got with this last guy and moved into his place, which had me in Berea, Washington, then I already had more stuff than I had when I first came out here. So I was better off to uh, perform more of a task of an automotive detailer. I went from winging it and making things work for me to having the things in place that I need to be able to do the job. Now, I knew it was very important for me to have a base. I, once I found out my brother was telling me the truth about how much it rained out here and how the weather was, I knew I needed a base. But see, what my brothers didn't understand, that every used car lot had to have the cars clean. Even the new car dealerships 
that had used car inventory, mainly cars that got traded in by a customer when a customer got another car, or maybe even some cars that they actually bought off the street from somebody, because a lot of dealership will buy cars from owners. Your paperwork got to be in order, and you got to have your car facts in, uh, in order too, but a lot of them will buy your car. They like sell us your car, right, kind of thing. So that alone made it easier for me, right? It's like I knew this. I knew that in order for a bank, to want to lend a loan to a person that's trying to buy a new car when the bank got repo cars that they lent loans on and they had to have the car, uh, what do you call it, call the word, uh, I would say repossess uh, as a term, uh, well, repossessed, then they got their own cars they're trying to sell. So if you're going to get a loan from a bank, especially to buy a used car, the car got to be pretty much pretty sound. And the exterior and interior got to look a certain way because the bank wants you to be able to keep that car long enough to pay them their money back. They're not going to lend you no money on something that looks like a bad investment to them, right? So I, that was a part of, the business that my brother and them didn't understand, that was the part that I understood. That's why I knew that even though if it rained a lot out here, it was a good possibility I could still make money. Now, I didn't know I was going to make the amount of money I started making soon as I moved in, burying inside that man business with, with them. I had so much work. I had so much work going on. That, man, I was working at times, I was working 10 to 16-hour days. I was trying my best not to turn down work, but at times I had to turn down work. And I done all this without even a small business loan, right? The word of mouth is very important. The way that you explain what you know how to do. Because when you become an automotive detailer, detail business owner, you got to be able to explain to the customer uh, that call you on the phone or come by the business and want to have their car done or thinking about having their car done. You got to be able to sell your services to that person. You got to make that person feel like out of all the other places they could do business with, they clean cars. You're the right person to do business with. And in order to be able to do that, you gotta believe in your your you gotta know you gotta you gotta know about the service you offer. You gotta be confident enough to know that you could do the service that the customer is requiring you to do. And you gotta be able to deliver. Because if you just talk good and then you can't deliver on the quality of work that you're promising then you're not going to stay in business a long, uh, a long time because the word of mouth could do two things. It could help you or it could hurt you. I stayed in, um, I stayed at, I stayed in the city of Berry, um, performing automotive detailing out of that one particular detail shop, right? Because what we had, we had Pacific Rim, Leasing, which was the guy that brought me in. He leased cars, he sold cars, and he bought cars for dealerships, used cars for dealerships, right? And then you had EJ's Automotive Detailing, all in the same thing. And that was a great combination for me. Um, To say it briefly for those that wonder what happened, in 1999, I got rear-ended, and um, the the company that rear-ended me, the guy that worked for the company that rear-ended me, he admitted that he wasn't paying attention when he hit me in the back. Okay, when he hit me in the back, I took a hard lick and, to and totaled the car out 
the car I was driving was one of the used car lots I worked. Matter of fact, it was the used car lot I worked that just, they gave me my first opportunity when I first went to talk about doing some uh, automotive detailing work for a used car lot. And so I couldn't work. I was actually messed up. Uh, I think I stayed, I worked for almost two months. Being a small business owner, I didn't have no L&I because I didn't pay L&I on myself. I didn't have no kind of insurance, period, right? I had to downsize my detail shop because I finally got to the point to where I knew how many people it took, even if I had to work harder, to make a profit out of my business without paying all my money out in overhead. So my I had downsized my business down to two people, one full-time detailer, and uh, a part-time detailer that was going to school and he only worked when he had time to work or he needed to make some money. So I was off of work for about two months and during the process of being off of work for two months, I was checking in with the places, the used car lots in the areas that I was doing business with. And they let me know they appreciated my work, but they told me the show goes on, you know, you can't you can't do the work right now and we in the business of selling cars so we can't hold our, hold our our business up uh waiting on you to get well so you go ahead and get well and once you're able to work again you go see if you come back and see us and we'll see what we can do okay when i got to where i could move around i started going back to some of these these used car lots a new car new car dealership that was um uh, let me do the used cars and they said they would give me overflow but they wouldn't give me the bulk of the work like i was once getting because they needed to have an operation a detail operation that had numerous detail where something happened to one the show goes on right so i understood what they were saying from a business point of view me not having enough person people working for me that will allow the business to continue to roll when I was down. So I got to the point to where I was doing overflow work. Around this time, I was talking to my father about what had happened. My father was in bidding for himself for 50 years. He was telling me that he didn't want me to end up like him. He was like, son, if I was you, I would try to find me a dealership to work at. And if you add your benefits, Right along with the amount of money the dealership are paying you, maybe it might be best for you to work that dealership, right? Instead of trying to be uh, 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 self-employed business owner, because that could go come back and hunt, hunt you and hurt you like it did me. So I had another uh, guy that I met that was a technician at the Saturn dealership that I first got on, like I said, back on Halloween, October 31st, uh, 1994. He had became service manager. He needed a detailed supervisor. We had maintained uh, contact with each other over a period of time, and he offered me a job. He said, man, you should come on over there, come on over here and take this uh, detailed supervisor job I got. He said, we'll work out some days to where you can have Saturday, Sunday, and possibly Monday to still do your detail thing for yourself. And then the other day you can work for us and then you'll have regular money coming in. He said, if you do that, I'll allow you to put some of your uh, business flyers in the service drive. And for all the detail we can't do here, then we will recommend our customers to you. And that's what I did. I went back to Saturn again and started working for Saturn. And it worked out pretty damn fine. I worked at Saturn for a couple of years. Then I left Saturn and I went to a big-ass Dodge store that was owned by a uh, company, a uh, uh, business by the name of Lithia. Lithia had a lot of stores um, at the time. And they had several stores in the Seattle, Washington uh, metro areas. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Litty is like the third largest automotive group in the United States. I currently work for Litty again. Right now, I've been working for Litty 
six years. That's automotive detailing. So I'm saying this to say it's money in the automotive field, especially the automotive detailing field. The automotive detailing field that branched out like a tree with limbs. So you got all these different limbs that's letting automotive detailing branch out in different directions. You know, I'm talking about uh, wraps. I'm talking about tent. I'm talking about ground effects. I'm talking about uh, the paint protection film. Detail, automotive detail have been that branched it out so far, man. So it's so much money to be made in the automotive detailing industry. You just got to tap into it. You got to be willing to take chances. You got to be willing to work hard. And you got to uh, fine tune your craft. Right? Because once you learn to believe in yourself and the service you have to offer, then when you talk to someone and they ask you questions or concerning the services that you're trying to sell them, then that confidence that you got inside you is going to display on your face and it's going to come out your mouth. So for a lot of, uh, I would say, on Facebook, I'm on several detail pages, and I listen to some of the things that the automotive detail are going through, especially the ones that don't have a base and they're trying to go mobile in the, during the whole four seasons, where that's going to be difficult, especially in a region like uh, the Seattle, Washington area, right? Because it does rain and it does get cold. While you're around here trying to spend time trying to figure out how to have a mobile, the best plan to have is to be set up mobile whenever you want to go mobile and have yourself a little base that you can work out of. Now, I'm going to get ready to end this, um, this, um, this video. But before I end this video, I want to say this too. It's things that I did mention. Like, it's so many used car lots that had actual garages that I worked out of. I done worked out of Auburn, Washington. I done worked out of Seattle, Washington garage. I done worked out of um, um, Renton, Washington garages. I done worked out of Tacoma garages. I done worked out of uh, North Seattle uh, garages. I done worked out of um, Kent Washington garages, right? I've done mobile. And when I say working on the garages, what I mean is a lot of used car lots that sell cars, they have garage space, right? They have it for the mechanics, right? So worst case, you could always go and offer them a proposition. It's been times I did used car details. I pressure wash the lot on the pressure wash the cars on the lot that I rented space from, right? So when you pressure washing a lot that you rented space from and you doing their used cars, if you could get them to let you do so many outside projects to put some extra money in your pocket, you can make a living doing that, right? It's all kinds of ways to make money in the automotive detailing trade. Maybe it was easy for me because I've always been a hustler. When I lived in the city of Mobile, the state of Alabama, I have been hustling for a while, right? I know how to sell what I do. It ain't nothing I can't do that I can't explain it good enough to convince whoever listening or whatever inquiring mind that I could do, that I sound like I could do what I said I could do. And then it's up to me to damn do it. So if you want to go mobile, that's fine. But if you want to work every year, because if you don't watch out, you'll be just like me. I ran a damn detail shop, my own detail shop for six years. Within that six years, I told myself I was going to work from March to October. And then when the weather started getting bad, I was going to be off sometime in October all the way back to the first week of March, the second week of March. Six years I said that, six years I did not do it. I found myself working year-round, even in the cold, because of how I spent my money. 
I didn't, the money I put aside wasn't there when that time of the year came for me to do it. So I'm saying that to say, you always got to have a backup plan, man. When I'm riding in my car and I'm going through different cities around Seattle and I see these garages and I see these used car lots, I know they need to have the car lot, cars pressure wash and they might need an in-house detailer. So when I'm looking at all that and seeing all that, I'm like, man, that's another prime example or another prime, prime uh, opportunity waiting to happen. So in my mind, the only reason a person can stay uh, mobile and not work year-round or mobile and be dealing with the weather elements is because they ain't changed their frame of thinking. If they change their frame of thinking, then they can put themselves in position. Now, this is only applied to the people that actually want to have a base or want to work every year and can't get out there like they want to because the weather is bad. If you continue to want to make money, because the bill's going to keep coming. So it's up to you to make the money to try to offset your, uh, your living expenses, right? So if you really want to continue to work, get a little creative, you know, get a little creative. Uh, I never thought the first place that I asked, could they use a detailer, would say yes. I didn't think that, but I went and asked, and when the guy asked me what all I knew how to do, I told him what I knew how to do, and what I told him then is only a drop in the bucket what I've learned since the last 29 years that I told him that, because it's gone on 30 years, and like I said, I told him that in 95, and what, we in 2024? Next year, that'll be 30 years. So I done proved to myself, if I wanted to right now, I could go right back out in business. And I did not muddy my name up. And that's and that means a lot. To be in the automotive business and have people that say you did good business and they'll do business with you again. Or have people that can't say that you gave them a good bad services mean a lot in this automotive detailing industry. And not just the automotive detailing industry. In any industries, special, um, small business businesses, that word of mouth will hurt you or it will help you. So it depends on what kind of work you put in. Hopefully, what you'll get out. So before I go, I'm gonna hold this up, and I'm hoping y'all can see this pretty good. And I'm gonna move up a little closer. And that's my YouTube channel for all those that want to find me. I'm there. If I'm not mistaken, I got 340 to 60 videos. I left lost count. But I got that many videos on my YouTube channel. And I'm steady adding more to it. All right. Before I go. I'm going to stand up and just let y'all see some of the stuff that I'm about for when I do get ready to go mobile. Now, bear in mind, I still work a full-time job. So this is just some of the stuff that I'm about for when I get ready to go mobile. This is the first orbital machine I ever owned right here. Since then, I'd upgrade to the one in the back. I got all kinds of uh, high-speed buffers. Some people call them rotor rotary buffers. I got my carpet cleaning machine. I got my um, humidifier right there, uh, ozone machine. I bought this electric painter to be able to spray paint fender wheels and undercarriages. I got two different palm sounders. This is just having to be the one that's battery operated. These are just tools that I bought last year to upgrade my my uh, my detail supplies for when I do want to go mobile. 
I could go mobile. I could go mobile right now if I wanted to. I got enough stuff to be able to go do a full mobile. I've definitely got to get a vehicle, though, to haul some of this stuff. Wouldn't want to continue hauling in the cars that I got now. But it takes money to make money. EJ signing out. Peace.